So after three years of working with each other, um, we started to learn a lot, like we're kind of decompressing, asking each other questions like, oh, would we do that again? Would we do that again? And we thought, hey, why don't we, why don't we do a Q&A session with each other and kind of let it be raw and, and, and kind of first, first impressions. So he wrote some questions, I wrote some questions. We didn't share the questions. So I'm going to be answering as honestly as I can about the whole uh, startup and entrepreneurship process that we, we kind of went through. Um, Alan's going to introduce the product. I kind of just told him to do that now. Um, but before he introduces, I want to ask a couple questions to you guys. How many um, business degree graduates do we have in the room? Raise your hand. A couple business folks. This would include finance or accounting or any marketing or anything like that. Okay, how many uh, computer science or information systems folks? Raise them high so I can, we can see. There we go. Uh, what about any liberal arts, political science, history? One, two, three. Okay. What are we missing? What, what are you guys doing here? Fine arts. Fine arts. Advertising. Well, that's part of business. You're supposed to raise your hand. What's that? Physics, yeah. Hey, he just spoke of the physics department. Economics. You guys are going to need real jobs when you get done. Just kidding. Just playing. Some of my jokes will be a little dry and a little harsh, but we'll, we'll try and get there. All right, so Alan's going to talk Space Monkey and, and about the product. I'm going to have Clint get that out. So, so this is a Space Monkey. Uh, and, and the Space Monkey is a device and a service. Uh, when, we, when we set out to do this in 2011, there were two big problems that, that we wanted to solve. Uh, the first one was a growing demand for consumer storage in the cloud especially. Um, in fact, a demand that, that wasn't being met by the supply on the, on the cloud provider side. So it was a problem that we first saw at Mosey, uh, where we had users who uh, could store way more data than, than, than Mosey could afford to store for them. Uh, the, the, and the second part of that problem is that supply side problem. So, so why is that? And, and the main problem with the way that cloud storage is architected today is that uh, it's built in expensive data centers. And data centers cost a lot of money to, to build and to operate. So we said, let's do something crazy. Let's get rid of the data center. Let's make a device that goes in the home. These devices will talk to each other. They'll form sort of a peer-to-peer -peer storage fabric and give you all the benefits of cloud storage at, at, at a reduced price and, and more storage than you could get otherwise. So, that's the Space Monkey story. Um, and in non-technical speak, it means that when you take a photo, it goes to this drive, no matter where you are. Okay, Ladies, how many use iOS? Raise your hand if you're a female and you use iOS. How many of you are running out of storage on your phone? Keep your hand raised up. All right, basically everybody kept their hand up. So all your storage can be stored here, freeing up the space on your phone. And then as soon as you store it here, we encrypt it, break it up in tiny pieces, and we spray it around to other devices in our network. So if your drive fails or your phone gets lost at the same time, your data is always safe. So that's Space Monkey. Yep. Uh, and there's, there's lots more to the history there that we'll probably dive into a little bit here as we, as we, as we uh, ask each other some questions. Anything else you want to say about that? No, that's the, that's the device. And we're giving two of these away. We're not sure how we're going to give them away. Maybe like, Maybe the best question, whoever gives us the best question, not covered by our own questions, we'll get a Space Monkey drive. And then for anybody who asks a not the best question, we'll give you a set of headphones <laughs> so that you can listen to yourself. Just kidding. All right. Oh, man, these are so you, not in order. You, you want me to go first yeah, while you're you getting those Yeah, you go first. Go for it. OK, so, so I'm going to preface this question with um, actually a little background. Uh, Clint and I knew each other before we, we, we started this. We, we, how long did we work together? A year and a half? Two years? Two years. Two years. Um, and, and one of the reasons that uh, this was an attractive opportunity to, to partner with him in, in, in going down this journey was that he was good at, I knew he was good at several things. Um, and, and this question will allude to one of the things that, that he is good at. So Clint, what is hustle? Hustle. Well, that's not the guy standing on the corner of the street off the freeway. Hustle is, um, actually it's a good question. Hustle is knowing that you've got something to do, but you don't necessarily know how to do it. So you just, you just kind of figure out on your own how to do it. So for example, I think the example of this is, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any money, okay? We'd raised a little bit of, uh, we'd saved a little bit of our own money 
Um, but we knew that the project that we were going to build it was going to require millions of dollars, and so we needed to get venture capital funding. So I think hustle was knowing that we needed venture capital funding, but not having any, we, we didn't know any VCs. Um, I didn't have a rich dad. Alan didn't have a rich dad. Um, we didn't know Uncle Romney. You know, all those things in place, like we didn't know. So how do you get that money? How do you, how do you, how do you convince somebody to cut you a check? Um, and, and actually, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of not knowing what you don't know, like, and then, and then saying, okay, I'm just going to go do it. And, and I'm going to go and ask, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to be willing to absorb as much as I can. And, and then the best part about hustling is that you've got to be able to take no's. Um, the story behind this is, so Alan is better at taking a no than I am. I get emotional. I, get, I love no's. I get, yeah, he loves the no. I, I, get, I get all twisted up and mental um, when I get a no. Because um, I remember the first no we got from a real venture capitalist. Um, he loved our presentation. He's like, oh, let me just go get my checkbook. I'll be right back. And he didn't come back. <laughs> I was twisted. I went, after, after that, Alan had to like, calm me down. And he was like, oh, it's OK. You know, so, but I think with the no's, you keep, you keep figuring out new paths. Um, there was a time in our history where we had hit every venture capitalist that we thought we knew or thought we had like one degree, two degrees. You know, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, that's the game you play with venture capitalists. It's like six degrees of Kevin Baker, Bacon venture capitalist style. And you're like, hey, do you know this guy? Do you know that guy? Hey, can you make an introduction to this guy? And, and you'll take the thinnest thread of like, oh, this guy's three connections away from somebody at Sequoia or Kleiner Perkins or whatever. And you'll, you'll, you'll just push that and, and, and keep going until you find somebody. And, and when you think you're tired and done, that's when, that's when like, you know, beast mode kind of kicks in and you hustle harder and you keep going. So hustling is really just never accepting defeat and, and then just moving forward with one goal and purpose. You know, whatever that one goal is for us, it was our first goal was get venture capital. That was everything else didn't matter. First employee, uh, legal documents to set up the company, all that stuff didn't matter. It was just go get venture funding. Good. My, my, my next question was going to be, tell us a story about hustling, but I think you did that. So yeah. you, you have one for me there? Yeah, I've got one. So um, is venture capital the same in Utah as it is in Silicon Valley? Great question. So, uh, you know, we, we, we pitched everybody. We pitched anyone who would listen to us, especially early on. Um, you know, we pitched guys over the phone. We pitched guys over Skype. We pitched guys here in Utah. We pitched people in, in the Bay Area. We, we, we would drive out, speaking of hustling, we, would, uh, we didn't have enough money for airfare, so we would make the 12-hour drive out to the bay in, in Clint's truck or my car. That was a lot of fun. I remember that? A lot of credit card debt. Um, so, so, yeah, what, what, what are some differences? So uh, there, there are a lot of good people, I think, in, in the venture scene here in Utah, um, but there, there's some unique attributes of, uh, at least for a tech startup, of, of connecting with, with Bay Area uh, venture. Um, some of the things that, that, that you want to look out for um, that, that I think are... Well, let me step back. So out in the Bay Area, there, there are a lot of VCs, and they're competing for deals. And they know that, that their reputation is at stake for how they treat founders and entrepreneurs. Um, and that creates some, some incentives that align with, with the founders or with the entrepreneurs' uh, incentives in terms of making sure the deal is fair, making sure that um, founders are still incentivized long term when they might have to take another round or two of funding to stick with the company. Um, we found that, that occasionally we wouldn't quite get those market conditions here in Utah when talking with somebody. Again, that's not a blanket statement. That's <laughs> he's, a, he's being nice. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, just a statement of, of market conditions. And so um, th things to look out for. Uh, I think, um, you know, how many of you have heard, um, heard advice about avoiding scams or getting scammed in your life? Anybody ever heard any advice? Okay, so, so you hear things like watch out for people who use religious credentials to try to convince you. Look out for people who you know, use high-pressure sales For tactics. example, I'm Go asking, the, what's the example? Well, somebody who says, hey, I'm, I don't know, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a stake president, so you should trust me, right? Um, uh, look out for, um, you know, pe people that say, hey, don't go, go, don't go talk to anybody else. Just trust me, you know, talk to me, because um, I, I want to do this deal with you, and I, I really like you a lot. Um, those, are, those are signs that aren't, don't necessarily convey malicious intent, but convey sort of a, 
I think, an ignorance of how markets work, right? You don't, you don't uh, if, if you want somebody to get a good deal and you want to get a good deal yourself, you don't say, only look at this one house. Like, don't go look at any other houses. Trust me, this is the house for you. No, you, you, you tell that person to go look at houses and come back and make sure that they're getting a fair deal on the, on the house. So what, what, let me follow up with a question around fair terms. If, if I'm a first time entrepreneur and, and I'm doing tech startup and I'm looking at venture capital, um, how do I know whether the terms that I'm getting from a, from, an, from a venture capitalist is a fair set of terms, whether that's here in Utah or in the Bay Area or Boston or New York? How do, I, how do I know? What do I use? How do it's I great. get go through so, the process? So again, it's, it's a market pricing. Like, like terms for deals sort of fluctuate and there are norms, right? So when, when venture capital is, is abundant, founders get better terms. When it's sparse, founders get slightly less, ter less, less good terms. So the only way you can know is by either talking to other people who are doing deals or getting deals or by you know, talking to multiple people who might all want into your deal and have them sort of compete for that. Um, so that's, that's really important. Um, but you've also got to figure out from a perspective of your own business, you've got to have a plan, right? Not, not necessarily a business plan, but it's sort of a financial model of, of what you expect you're going to need to raise over time. Because that's, that's going to inform how much you can give away right now in that first investment that you take. You know, if, if you know that you're going to have to do, to really be successful, you're going to have to take three rounds of investment, then you can't give away 50% on that first round. Like, Should you ever give 50% of your company away to, to an investor? Oh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I can say never, but I, mm. I know for sure in that first round, for us, it would have been I think he's lying. How many of you guys thing. think he's not telling you? Should you ever give 50% of your company away in, in a tech company? For the They're right saying price. No. For the right price. For the right price. I, 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 here's, here's what I take. You don't know what's going to happen over the next two years or three years of your company. So there's just no way you can give up that much of your company. You just can't. So even if, and we were offered 50% of our company for a million bucks, and we didn't have, we, all we had was a, a slide deck. We couldn't even give you guys a slide deck here. So, um, yeah. Well, so, so there, yeah, they, they, I mean, there are two different governance mechanisms, right? There's, there's total stock that, that is owned, but there's also a, a board of directors, and that's, that's where the real governance of the company comes in. So, so board seats are usually given in conjunction with, with equity, but they don't necessarily have to be. And so, yeah. so in our case, we had two, two of us on the board, then we added a third just so that we could have a tiebreaker if we ever had any concerns, but we never broke more than three three people on the board. So even though our stock was diluted to 50 something percent, I mean, you know, technically, you know, somebody could have stock control of our company, but, but if you don't have board control, then it doesn't, then it doesn't matter. So, so which, you know, that's a good question, but I think when you're selling equity in your company, um, I think you should look at norms and look at, and there are lots of blogs where people, or go to Quora, a lot of people are, are writing about, hey, I, you know, is this a fair term? I'm giving you know, 20% of my company away for, for, for $500,000. Um, one thing you get to understand is most venture capitalists realize that they're buying for future value. Okay? They're not buying for the current value of your company. You and that one dude who still lives in his mom's basement aren't worth anything. And that's just like, that's the given truth. You're not worth anything. It's future value of what you're going to do when you move out of mom's basement and, and create a multi-billion dollar company. That's, that's the truth. Let, let, let me tell you a, qu a quick story about um, two different responses to, to a situation. Uh, so, so early on, we had an investor who, who ended up putting money in, who we love, um, who, who said to us, I don't think you're raising enough. Uh, you, you should probably raise more money. Now, there's, there's, there's two things that can follow from that after that sentence. The, the first one would be, therefore, I want more of your company, and I'll give you some more money. The second would be, just, just raise, your, um, raise your valuation, and uh, I'll take less of your company so that you can raise more money on the same valuation. And that's what, that's what this investor told us. Yeah. He said, you should just do that. And that's, you know, that's, a, that's a great, I don't know, maybe it was a, meta, a Jedi mind trick, but it was a great um, trust creator between us and, and this investor. Yeah, and because he, want, he didn't care about whether we took more of his own money or went and found money elsewhere, what he was signaling to us was that he saw the future of the business. He saw that, hey, it may take you two years to get the product out. We were doing a hardware product, so you're going to need more capital to do hardware. So he was, he was helping us, um, which I'm going to lead into another question. I'm going to steal another okay. question. Uh, on the role of advisors, 
how many people came to us and asked for advisors, and what would you do, and I want you to be brutally honest, would you take advisors, and especially advisors who say, oh, I, I, I don't work for free, I take, I, yeah, you have great. to give me some equity. Great, so yeah, we did have this experience where there were guys that came and said, oh, I can add so much value. Give me some, give me I know some equity. all these investors. I can hook I you up. I can get you deals. I can, I can. I'll tweet. I'll tweet this, and all of a sudden, a million people will see your product. Yeah. So, so I'll give the same advice that I know Clint and I give to people when they ask us if if we can advise. Don't give equity until they've proven. Like, like, go ahead and say, hey, come work for me for a month or three months, and let's let's you know, like just for nothing. And if if it's working out for you and it's working out for us, then we'll talk equity. That's the right. That's the way, right way to have that. that yeah, and that I think if they're doing advisor sh advisor roles for introduction to venture capitalists or something yeah. like that, um, their, yeah, equity should, that. their equity should only be tied if you, you get funding from company. But even then, I would argue that like most people do it out of good karma. Like, hey, let me introduce you to this this venture capitalist or to this firm or whatever this angel investor, um, and they'll say, hey, I, I don't need anything. Uh, it's been I've advised a few tech companies since. And they're always like, well, so-and-so wants us to give him equity for his advisor role. I'm like, that's your choice. I'm not going to ever ask you for anything. I just think that if anybody in the Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley world watches this YouTube video, which is not likely, but if you are watching it, let's stop the advisor for, for, for equity role. Yeah. I think it's just. Yeah, don't, don't ever pay for introductions. Introductions are free. Yeah. Um, you can find an introduction for free. Um, I mean, we, we did give some advisor shares, but it was almost always sort of after the fact, hey, thanks for helping us out. Yep. Or we, gonna, or gonna... we made sure that they invested as well. That yep. was probably the best thing we did. We said, like, guys would come to us and say, oh, I want to be an advisor. Great. Our round is this. You can put in $50,000. You can put $100,000. And we'll give you some, some advisor shares to go along with your investment. Um, but we, you, always had to, you, you always had to show me the money. I mean, that's just, that's just sound advice, guys. Even if it's your dad, say, show me the money, dad. And, and this is this is I think one thing that, that we struggled with at times was we had we had you know we'd formed some pretty good connections with people um, and had some some good people that we could draw advice from but being in Utah we were a little bit disconnected from them and so we didn't often we didn't go to that well all the time maybe as often as we should have yep. they they can add value yep for sure okay you ready I'm ready ready for the next one uh, this is sort of a follow up to the first one that I asked you um, how is luck related to hustle. Oh, how many of you guys believe in luck? A few of you guys believe in luck? Like, oh, that dude's just lucky. He was born into wealth. No, I don't buy that. So I, I take, I take the, uh, the, fa the founders of our the fathers, father, found, founding fathers, blah, blah, blah. Founding fathers' view of this. Luck is something that you generate. Um, you know, you can't, you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. You can't be, you know, in position to not have luck fall on you. You can't say, oh, uh, I'm gonna get a million dollars of venture capital funding, but never talk to a single venture capitalist. You just can't do it. I mean, that, you, you, that there's no such thing as that type of luck. VCs don't call you up and say, hey, I know you're looking for venture capital, but you're not willing to talk to anybody. Here's a million bucks. You're not that lucky. Luck is built. It's work that you put into it. It's how many calls you take, how many meetings you took. I remember when we were so poor that we were staying you know, at my friend's house on an uncomfortable beanbag um, you know, in, in Mountain View, having to um, you know, walk up and down Sand Hill Road because we couldn't afford a rental car or um, you know, just meeting with as many people as we could. And you know, we, had, we had some of those luck experiences where um, you know, I remember the first $100,000 we got, it was, you know, we had just gotten back from a Bay Area trip, some personal things that happened in our families, and I get this Skype message that says, hey, do you have a second to talk? And I'm like, yep, calls me up. He's like, he's like yeah, uh, have you gotten the documents yet? We wanna, we, we, I wanted to send this $100,000 check over, and we're like, whoa, we, hadn't, we talked to this venture capitalist eight, eight weeks before, and his, he had thought his partner was gonna send the docs and sign everything and then send us the money, but his partner had gone on vacation, and he was just waiting on this check for $100,000. It was pretty lucky, in my opinion, because you know, what, what had happened? Well, we'd put ourselves in a position, we'd kept pitching, kept talking to people, um, and he was super excited. So yeah, I, I think luck is where you put yourself. You can be lucky uh, when you get there, when you put the work in to, to be there. Yeah, so, and, and it's totally related to hustle. Absolutely, great. Um, I, 
just to reiterate that, I think uh, l luck, luck happens. I mean, we're, we're lucky, but it doesn't happen if you're not in the game. You, you can't make the shot if you don't take it. You can't make the shot if you're not running up and down the court. So you got you to be in the game. All right, so my question is, how do I learn? Uh, well, here, here's a question. Um, I'm being facetious here a little bit, guys, so don't be offended. Um, I have PowerPoint skills and I have spreadsheet skills. How important am I to the company, Alan? Yeah, so, <laughs> so those, those are valuable skills. Um, but, he, but He's the smart one, I promise you. I'm not the smart one, so I don't know why he picked me. That's, a, that's what the real question is. Why, why would you do a startup with me, a guy like me who doesn't have any... So, so, so as, I, as I mentioned, Clint and I had a relationship before, before we started this company. And that relationship was as, as, with Clint as product manager over, over a team that, that I worked on. Um, product managers in software have an have a interesting relationship because software engineers don't report to them. They're not, there's not a boss-employee relationship there. It's, uh, it's a relationship of, um, hey guys, this is what the product should be. Can I convince you of that and convince you to, to build the things that we think are priorities? Um, and so effective product managers, I think, have a, a unique set of skills where they can uh, convince people without the, without the threat of force to do things that are right. Um, and the best product managers are, are loved by, by software engineers. So, so Clint was one that I knew other software engineers um, recognized and respected and liked working with. So that was, that was a huge factor in me. Um, it wasn't for Clint's. Clint's spreadsheet skills aren't actually that good. <laughs> no, they're not so. actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so I'm going to add on to this because I think there's a strain here. How many of you would like to do a technical startup? Raise your hand. Techni what, would love to get venture capital, would love to do, be on TechCrunch, all that stuff. How many of you who are, keep your hand raised if you're one of those. How many of you are the technical co-founder or not the technical co-founder, keep your hand raised? Okay. If you're not the technical co-founder, I mean, you don't have the engineering skills like me. You're, you're like this guy, right? Okay, so, so you, have a, you have a challenge. Your challenge is you want to go over to not this building, but the building over across the street where they do land parties. You guys know what land parties are, right? Okay, so land parties instead of Friday night dates is where a lot of those guys are working on other things, okay? So, so you have a challenge. You have an inherent challenge. Here's my advice. Don't go to that building to go and convince an engineer to come build your product that's going to change the world. Okay? I think that's the worst thing that you could do. The best thing that you could do is tell mom and dad, hey, I'm going to extend my education an extra year because I'm going to take some CS courses and I'm going to learn some of the basics of the product that I need to build. So whether it's a, a web app, I'm going to take some web courses, or if it's an iOS or Android app, I'm going to take some mobile development courses. And you may not be great with, with uh, computer programming or proficient, but, but the ability to at least speak their language so that when the stars align and you know, all those things come across and you do meet your Alan, you know, you'll be able to speak their language and they will trust you. Because right now what they don't trust is Oh man, I've got this great idea. It's gonna make billions, bro. Billions. We are gonna change the world. It's gonna be awesome. They don't. They don't understand that. That that doesn't compute. So being able to say, hey, you know, um, I'm working on this app and I need some help. Uh, I'm stuck. I've been trying to write this algorithm to solve this problem, and this is where I've gotten. Would you mind taking an hour to just kind of walk me through some things? Then they will start going, oh, hey, that's an interesting problem. Because the, 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 the difference between Alan and I, actually, there's not much difference, but I mean, I'm polarizing this for the, the beard. conversation. The beard. <laughs> One of my questions is, here, should Alan grow a beard? Um, but we're not that much different, but I'm polarizing for the topic here, and that is he's more motivated by the challenge than the money. The money is important to a degree, to, you know, like, okay, yeah, I'd love to have enough to take care of my family and things like that. But here's the simple question. Are you more interested in working for money or working, for, working on, on really hard, mental, challenging problems? The, the latter. Why? Well, I mean, money, I don't know, what, what good is it? I mean, right? No, I mean, think about it. Look, look, you, you can, you Private can, jets. We, we, live, we live in a great country, right? I mean, you Ritz can. Ritz-Carlton. Yeah, it's pretty good. 
Um, New you cars. Can, you can, you can, you can almost not work in this country and still and still feed tailored yourself. Tailored suits. Right, and you can, you can buy a tailored suit if you earn Trips enough. Trips to London. Trips to London. Um, but what you do every day with your life, right? What you do, what you do, eight hours a day, ten hours a day, twelve, hours, whatever it is, that's that's where your that's where your time's invested, and time is way more precious than money, right? I mean, yeah. none of us can make more time for ourselves. Like, the, and we that's have, the truth. We have a finite amount of time, each of us. You know, I think Clint and I, we're, we're a little bit older than you guys, so we're, we, we, we think about death a little, maybe a little bit more often. How often do you think about death, Clint? Uh, every time I'm changing a diaper. <laughs> so, so I actually think my kids are up at the top there, or they were earlier. So, so, so I mean, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can make money, and there's a lot of ways you can live your life, but um, finding a purpose higher than that. I like the saying, I, I don't know who said it first. Maybe it was Elon Musk. I don't know. The, the saying that you don't, you don't wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to breathe, right? Breathing is my goal today. <laughs> that's like in business, breathing for a business is making money. You, you, you have to do it. But if that's your end goal, you're not, you're not building a rocket to, go to, to, to colonize Mars. You're not building an electric car to change how yeah. the auto industry works. It's you're not, really hard to make money in those. You're not building a, a storage device for consumers to change fundamentally how the industry does data storage and cloud storage for people. So... Yeah. That, that purpose is what I think drives me, and I, I know it actually drives Clint as well. It, it is, and I was just polarizing. It really is. You've you got to find your North Star. I mean, guys, I don't, I don't know any of you, and I apologize. I, I hope that maybe someday I'll be able to, to meet you and, and, and have a, a profound impact in your life. But those people who do have a profound impact in your life, and if you don't have any, find some, you should have mentors, and, and mentors will help you. And I, I look at the mentors I had over my lifetime, whether they be my parents or other people that were executives at other companies, they were always telling me to find my North Star, find the thing that I love, the thing that I was passionate. And when I took the LSAT, I realized that that wasn't my North Star. Shockingly, going to law school was not gonna be what would make me happy. And hanging out with this guy 10, 12, 15 hours, even having to share a bed in a hotel when we didn't have money, you know, that it was all. It was all. It was all okay. There were pillows, it wasn't lots of pillows in between us. It was. It was honor lots code compliant. Pillows. Don't I, worry. All I had mostly. to do was ask him to keep, take his socks off, though, because that's just disgusting. So, no. I, <laughs> I don't remember socks. That's he doesn't remember anything either. Just so you know, I have had to be his mental secretary since uh, for three years now. Um, so, so, but no, but the point is spending that much time with this guy, um, you better love what you're doing. You better love that. And, and, you, and you better have faith in the other person and trust. And I think that's one of the things. Um, we had worked with each other uh, a year and a half, almost two years previous to Space Monkey. But, you know, after outside of work, um, we had spent a total of two and a half hours. He showed up to my birthday party uninvited once. And, and that was like, that was it. That was all we knew of each other. Um, outside of outside of work, and so to go and do this, you better believe that you can, um, uh, you know, appreciate and, and enjoy um, that person who is, you know, I joke and say he's my other wife, but he probably jokes and say I'm his other wife. It's, it's just true. You, you spend so much time with them, and there are times when you'll have challenges. I mean, I, I probably should ask you what was the time that you had the most. He won't remember because he doesn't have a good memory. <laughs> What was the time that you had the most challenge with me starting this company? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I do remember, though? I, on, on Clint's point about, you know, go, go find some skills for whatever it is that you're building and start building it. Um, Clint actually built our, I, I, I said he wasn't very good with the spreadsheet, and that's, that's actually true. But Clint did build our first website that we launched the company with, so. Yeah, thank you, yeah. It was awful, as in awfully awesome. Um, but no, I mean, that's, that's an important thing. It's like, you may not have skills and that's the, in certain areas, but you better be ready to put the hat on. That's the hustle, too. I didn't have programming skills, but I decided to take some CS courses. I didn't have um, graphic design, but, you know, he, he knew how to use Photoshop or... Uh, the GIMP. GIMP, yeah. He knew how to use GIMP. So we, we, we figured it out ourselves, and, and we had a lot of fun. So, um, all right, I've got another question. So... Um, your biggest regret, mine is not taking the $6 million that a venture capitalist offered us early on, right off the bat. Um, what's your biggest regret? Wow. Um, Saying who you picked as a partner doesn't count. <laughs> I, 
Uh, I think, you know, I think you, you look back and you, and you realize you made a lot of mistakes, even onto a, a path that, that might be declared successful eventually. Um, I think that's inevitable. Uh, boy, we've made a lot, haven't we? Um, I, think, I think one of the biggest ones that, that, that we made, that I made, was maybe not getting the product out quite as, quite as quickly as we thought we would. Um, I think that was a big mistake. I think we recovered from it, but um, it was dicey there for a while. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's interesting. So, yeah, question over there. Or slower, yeah. Because money can often complicate. Do the opposite. Can right? can do the opposite. You think that oh hey I've got all this money, um, keep going, keep going. Um, I, I I so so you that's a great question, almost a space monkey worthy question. We'll see how everybody else stacks up. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I think if we had taken the my, my my mindset has always been you take as much money as you can, and you got to go as fast as you can because you're gonna hit a wall. So when the, when the balance goes to zero, you're gonna hit a wall, okay? When you can't pay paychecks anymore, and you got six employees, 10 employees, and one of them just had a baby, um, and, and all these other situations that are going on, you're gonna hit that, that zero, and you can't pay that paycheck. You need to be able to hit through the wall and break through it so that uh, you, know, you get your next round of funding. Um, I think if you, you, you get $6 million and then like you have $2 million in the bank before you go raise your next round, you always have this big, huge buffer, it tells the venture capitalists you're not moving fast enough. You're not using their money the way they've asked you to use it. And here's an example. If, I'm a fir in my, if I invested in your first round of funding, at, at uh, you, know, you raised $5 million and, and, and you, you went 24 months and maybe you got your product out, and, but you're now raising your next round and you've got two million left. What, what told me is you use that two million as a safety net and not two million to grow the wealth of the company or to grow the value of the company. And so as if I'm the first investor, I'm mad at you because you know, your job is to create value in the company, right? As quick and as fast as you can, grow the value. Well, you can't grow value in the company if that two million dollars is sitting in the bank. You need to spend it in order to grow it. And so I, I'll feel like, hey, I didn't get the worth of the company that I deserved, so I, I want you to spend it. So to your point, I think in our case, my mindset would have been spend as fast as we can, but it would have required, I think, in our looking back, hindsight is we would have had to have a different mindset of certain things in the product, just we're going to leave that by the side. We're not going to do that. We're going to do this instead. And I think some of those decisions, uh, we, were, we, were, we were too nice. Um, which, I'm going to ask this question to Alan, um, what is your take on having a co-founder and should both of them be C co joint CEO or should one of them be CEO? Pick one. Pick one of them. I, I think, uh, you know, we, try, we tried to run a really flat organization for a little while in the company where nobody really had titles. And that's cool. That's that's great. And there there wasn't it's hierarchy. Super new age. It's, especially well, especially when you're small, you've only got you know your five or six people. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have a, a vice president and a and a manager in that mix. You're just throwing away money. Um, but but I think that led us to not make that decision about let's pick somebody who can make the final decision. Um, and I think that's that's important. You need that. Yeah, I think it's about deciding making decisions as fast as you can. And the more you have to go in circle around the best decision, sometimes the best decision is any decision, yeah. and then the ability to adjust uh, accordingly, so having somebody as well. But would you have done this by yourself? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think so. I, maybe, maybe now, but boy, um, it sure was nice having a co-founder to, to lean on to, and, and to share the load of, of the tough things we were going through, yeah, which I actually think, leads to my next yeah. question. I'm gonna oh. let this guy right here, he's got a question oh, for us. Go ahead. Good luck, dude. Well, I keep 100% of my equity, right? Or I can have a partner who does the tech, but I only get 50% equity. Let's say I find somebody there's, there's, not even a, there's not even a question here. So it's, it, look, have you done any development in India before? Yeah. How much? Major. What's that? I was my old major. Well, no, have you done development? Have you written, have you had engineers in India work oh, for no, you? I've, I've done it myself before. Okay, and it, was it an awesome experience? Was it super cool? Because you've made millions from your Here, first here's what, from here, your first from your first effort, right? I oh, you didn't. You didn't make millions for your first effort. Here's what I would say. I would say, um, dude, 
you want somebody who you can have late night pizzas with and like work on the product, even if it's giving up, because what is, what is 50% of the company to you when you make a $5 billion off of it? It's nothing. <laughs> Two, what, yep. What's the difference between, yeah, two and a half billion each? What, you need more than that? <laughs> I, I will, if, I, if you're asking me to be your co-founder, I'll question you all day long. I, why, why would I want to co-found somebody who needs 100% of the equity? We're, b bake a bigger pie. Bake a bigger pie. It's not about small hits and, you know, I mean, this is not, this is not um, Billy Bean baseball here. It's not singles, walks, and, and bunts. It's hitting home runs. Venture capital and tech startups are about hitting home runs. And then if you can't hit a home run, you move on to the next. So my personal take is you find the partner you're willing to split half with because guess what? When, when, when the crap hits the fan and you got to call your, 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 your VCs and say, look, I burnt all the money, it's gone, and we got nothing, You'll want, that, you'll want that one guy who's not in India that you can call up and say, hey, let's go get a Subway sandwich because we've got to make a tough call here and shut the business down. I, prom I, I just I couldn't yeah, have I, done it without I, somebody else. That's I, my take. I would, I would say um, I think that's a, good, uh, that's a good black and white answer to that. Um, and, and I like black and white answers. I, I, no, I, I, I do. Well, I do. Like, like, like that's, being decisive about things is, is really important. Um, for us, I, I can tell you, but I always couch my answers in, you know, what was right for us. Um, for us, we were building a highly technical product and a very complex product. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing things that people haven't done before. And, you know, when, when you've built software for a long time, you realize that probably half the value of that software is in people's heads, not in the actual software that they write. And so for us to, to, to ever outsource anything that we were doing didn't make sense because that's giving away way more of what we're creating. Does it ever make sense? I mean, come I, on, be brutal. These guys well, yeah, need, okay. need, these sure, guys need sure. honesty, so, your person. Like if I came to you and said to you right now, uh, we, got, we got eight, we got how many guys, 15 guys now? Yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to double that, but the best way to do that is I'm gonna outsource it to India so, and so I'm gonna double it. I, your, it your would depend, it would depend on, on, the, on the tech, it would depend for me. So here's why. I give here's, up. <laughs> here's why. If, if, if you're doing a, a technical product like Liar. we were, the answer is, is, is black and white, don't do that. If, if the answer is, this is a business, I don't know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, a, a scarf rental business and you just need a, an app for that, I don't know, that's not a complicated app. I, maybe that, maybe what would make sense, but for the most part, I think, I think You know what his next idea is, right? If you're <laughs> How many of you have that in your business your, model? Write it business down, model, write it your down. Your business model of competition. Write right? it down, scarf rental. Who is it, scarf Sc rental, pick it. Yeah, right there, all right. Okay. No, guys, another question. Afterwards, you can start a new company right now. Oh, that's, that's very sweet oh, of you. Thank you. I'll pay you later. And, and you can pick up your Space <laughs> Monkey afterwards, too, dude. You guys have such a large role because I don't think your product is just adding extra stuff to the company. You guys have a lot of money. Yeah, that's right. And that's right. the right take. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, <laughs> He's definitely getting two space monkeys now. <laughs> Working on it. Yeah. 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 Imagine a world without data centers. I mean, I mean, the, you're, you're talking about um, facilities that have row after row of hard drives stacked on top of each other. How many of you play Xbox or PlayStation? Raise your hand, own it. Come on, own it. Don't be, pre just because there's a girl next to you, don't say you're not playing Xbox. <laughs> what happens when you play the Xbox for many, many hours at a time? Other than your fingers getting sore, what happens to the box? Gets hot, right? Same thing in a data center. Tons and tons of heat generates, so they pump in tons and tons of cold air, refrigerated, refrigerated air, winter, summer, spring, fall, doesn't matter. And those costs that impact environmentally as well as the overall costs are what you're paying for in the data center. Electricity and air conditioning are the two biggest things that you're paying for. Bandwidth is next. And with our idea, it's no more electricity other than the few bucks it costs to, to, to run the, the small box. No cooling because it's 
ambient, and the bandwidth is already a fixed cost in the home. So, so yeah, you're spot on. And in the future, we totally see a world in which Netflix and other things could all be streamed from a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, as big as the world is today. So. Yeah, we, we, we are hoping to change the industry. I mean, this is, uh, for, for me, it would have been success even if we failed, if we got somebody else to go, hey, that's a good idea, we're gonna copy it and go do it right. Um, so, so, yeah, for us, it, it, was, it was about exactly that. Like, we wanna change how the world is, not just sell a product to a consumer. All right, question over there, the guy who's uh, pretending he's an airplane Thanks, thing. Or Uh, that's still TBD. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what is a successful base? Like 10 million users, a billion users? Yeah. So, so we, did, we did a Kickstarter because, uh, not, not to raise money, but to actually get access to a, a customer base that we thought would get it early on. Would um, you ever do a Kickstarter again? I would do something like a Kickstarter Such again. A I, don't, I don't know if I'd do it on Kickstarter, but I would do, I, the crowdfunding thing is kind of cool. It, it does give you access to the people. Yeah, we have some we have some heartburn. I have strong Kickstarter, feelings. So. Don't do Kickstarter. Why not? Because uh, it's a, yeah. How many of you guys? Let's raise your hand if you're gonna if you are thinking about your idea and doing it on Kickstarter. Raise your hand. Right, is nice and high. All right. So first challenge you have on Kickstarter is somebody's probably already done your idea on Kickstarter. Second challenge you have is they're gonna take a large percentage of the funds raised away from you. And what if you don't meet that goal that you set? And maybe some rules have changed. I don't know. It's been, been what, a year? So may, maybe some rules have changed. What are you going to do if you don't meet your goal? Did it mean you have a bad idea? Um, how are you going to get your Kickstarter project viral? How, how many of you guys seen our Kickstarter project? Raise your hand. Yeah, how many of you guys looked online? So what did we do? Um, Come on. <laughs> Three, who said it? So we did three hundred forty-nine thousand dollars. Do you have it right 000, there? Are you looking at it right now? Hundred thousand of it in the first day. Okay, pretty sweet, right? I mean, that's that's awesome. Hundred thousand. Watching that number just go up and up and up and up again. But you know what? You know how much work we took. It took us three months of solid, like meeting with with press and and, yeah. and interviews so and lining everything up. We have some scars as well. I mean, so so the Kickstarter platform scars when we did it statement. was was highly curated. And so you couldn't launch your Kickstarter project until somebody at Kickstarter had reviewed it and told you no twice and delayed all the press that you had lined up to go because they said no twice and they didn't, they didn't get around to reviewing it again for another three weeks. Um, though I think they fixed some of those things on the Kickstarter platform. It's a lot faster. I think it's almost, I don't think they have that gatekeeper process anymore. To still look at it, but the, but okay. the, but the so, biggest issue is diluted now. But it's, but but also, so I mean, many Kickstarter campaigns. Also, we, we looked at we looked at traffic. You know, what, one of the big advantages, the reason we went with Kickstarter instead of Indiegogo, is because they had this. I mean, it was sort of, sort of social network for, for crowdfunding, right? And so, if you get somebody prominent or somebody who's well connected on Kickstarter to, to back you, their backers would see that and bring them in. And if your product goes hot, it goes to the front page. Um, we we actually generated most of I our traffic. I've been everybody about my Kickstarter things. So they're all leaving. It's we, cool. we we generated most of the traffic to our Kickstarter page ourselves, and yeah. didn't didn't feel like we got a lot of help from Kickstarter. So that's part of our heartburn. Your your, your mileage may I, vary. I just think it's hard. I, I think that that for the effort um, going and building that Are customer we out of time? base. Here's the other thing with Kickstarter. We're done with time. Okay. Oh, is this Q and A okay. now? So we're so we're moving. To, oh. Should should we drop our microphones right now and move there? Is that? Mic drop. Well, let me, let, me, let me finish this one, one last beat up of Kickstarter here, and that is, uh, that is um, the user base has changed. The customer base on Kickstarter has changed. At first, it was all about, hey, I'm funding this cool project. Now it's, I'm buying this product from Kickstarter. There's a big difference. When somebody expects that that product is a storefront or, or your Kickstarter campaign is a storefront, they expect you to have the product out exactly when you say it's gonna be. They expect it to work absolutely perfect the first time. And, and they become a very difficult um, challenge from a customer perspective when you're too early. So you better make sure if you're gonna do Kickstarter, you know what you're doing with the product and the product's ready to go. So that's my take.